In this tutorial, we're going to go through the specific method that we use to do our shotgun proteomics. And so we, um, for our muscle samples, um, we take marine muscles and we excise the gill tissue and homogenize it in a urea um, and thiourea buffer. We do protein quantification. We do a trypsin digestion um, following the protocol by Pierce. And then we do a um, C18 spin column cleanup for desalting. Once our sample is ready, it is in 20% acetonitrile, I wanna say. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head, something like that. Um, and we have 40 microliters. And each of our samples contains 750 nanograms of protein per microliter. And so if we inject one microliter, into the instrument, we're injecting 750 nanograms of total protein. Um, so we have a fairly long analytical column. So it's a 25 centimeter column um, that was recommended by Thermo Fisher for extracting the most number of proteins um, and using like a relatively long gradient. And the service technician told me that this is the um, protocol that they use at Amgen um, when they're looking at complex protein samples. So if we go over to TeamViewer and we want to look at our particular um, method, there's a couple of ways we could do this. So you could go into instrument setup and then open up that particular method. Using, oops, let's maximize this. Um, using this open button or alternatively if we close this out we could go into our sequence setup go to instrument method and go to browse and this allows us to load um, any method that we want to use the method that we've been using um, is called the super duper method which again was named by that thermo technician that was modified a little bit um, off of what Anjan and Gem did to like include our um, normalized collision energy of 27, which seems to work best for our samples. So um, what I wanna do is go through and talk about um, what some of the parameters in this method are. So if you have been running proteomic samples using this, you'll have a better um, understanding of what actually happened during the course of your gradient run. So, um, Again, if we have this, this is our little instrument method that's already been set up. So we're in our loading pump, as you can see here. Um, as I mentioned in one of the other tutorials that we don't really um, worry about changing these um, values. What we do have is we set a flow rate. So our run lasts for 145 minutes, okay? Um, and again, our flow pump, we are, our loading pump has loading buffer coming in and both A, B, and C are coming from the same jar and that jar is 2% acetonitrile with 0.08% trifluoroacetic acid. Um, we put in 100% A, which is why there's no other colors here. Our flow rate for the first five minutes, which is the equilibration phase, which is just allowing things to kind of come back in case we're doing multiple um, runs, which often case we are. I'm going to equilibrate to our like normal flow through the column. Our flow rate is going to be five microliters per minute. And then as soon as that equilibration phase ends and our valves switch, so we're putting our sample online, um, we decrease our flow rate to two microliters per minute. And this continues for the duration of the run. In terms of the NC pump, um, again, these are just kind of general settings that you don't need to worry about for our flow gradient. You can see that there's a lot of things going on here. So we, again, have our 145 minute run and we're looking at our relative proportions of percent A and percent B. And so during the first five minutes, so from start to five minutes, our flow rate is 0.3 microliters per minute or 300 nanoliters per minute. And we're running through only 1% B. This just helps us save um, a little bit on chemicals. 
as that equilibration phase ends, we decrease our flow rate to 220 nanoliters per minute and increase the proportion of B being pumped in to um, 0.424%. So you can see that little bump here. This initiates the beginning of our gradient. And so over the course of the gradient, what we're gonna be slowly doing is transitioning more B into that flow meter that's gonna load onto the column. And what happens during this gradient is all of the proteins that have stuck onto the column um, during the sample loading and equilibration period, now we're going to be flushed off based off their polarity. Okay, so this is the whole premise of liquid chromatography and separation um, based on the um, properties of the protein fragment itself. Okay, so whether or not they're polar or nonpolar, um, or more polar or less polar, uh, will depend on which point, so which time, they decide to let go of the column and get injected into the mass spec. So our gradient goes from five minutes, or 5.1, to 125.1. And over the course of this 120 minute gradient, so it's two hours long, we increase slowly the proportion of B from 4% to 35%. So our gradient is 4% B to 35% B over the course of 120 minutes at a flow rate of 0.22 microliters per minute. Over the next approximately four minutes, we slowly increase the proportion of B and I guess we don't change the flow rate yet. It kind of also transitions. So we're changing both the, the flow rate to increase a little bit higher to 250 nanoliters per minute and then go up to 95% B. And what happens in this little um, step up, so you can see then we hold that and 90%, 95% B for four more additional minutes. And what that does is that washes everything off the column. So anything that doesn't come off in that 120 minute gradient, so up to about 35% B, usually isn't going to be protein. And so we want to get the rest of that stuff off so it doesn't clog our column so that the next time we run a sample, you have your clean column um, that's ready to bind your sample. So this is an important wash step. As soon as that wash is over, you can see that we then have um, another step in here so that we decrease really quickly um, our percent B back down to one. So we put it back in water and it continues out the rest of the protocol like that. And so if we're running multiple injections, which oftentimes we are, this is going to be the same conditions as what's happening as the next run starts, okay? And so um, it's again allowing your column to equilibrate from the fact that you just put it in very um, high concentrations of mobile phase and letting it adjust back to the aqueous phase so that um, you can load your sample onto it, okay? So that's an overview of the gradient that we use. Again, in terms of the sampler, um, for the vials that we use, these are the actual parameters with the puncture depth and um, sample height that you would want to use if you were setting up a new method. So reference this. Um, inject load, like I said before, we do microliter pickup, which means that one microliter of sample is gonna be loaded in with 19 microliters of loading buffer. And that loading buffer is coming from our transport vial that's an R1, that's coming from um, the loading pump and we have our samples held at four degrees because oftentimes we have multiple samples sitting in the chamber. In terms of our column oven, we've gone over this before, but we maintain the temperature at 35 degrees. This is recommended for the particular column that we use. So because it's longer, you need to heat them. Um, and that comes with the manufacturer's instructions. So if you're changing the column, you may wanna hold the temperature a little bit lower, but that's something to verify. And then again, importantly, um, you can see here we have a switching of our valves. And so for the first five minutes, as we're loading our sample onto the column, the trap column is not in line, right? So you just have a C to nitrile that's being flushed through the column. It's equilibrating. Everything else is going out to waste, which might be any of the junk that was in your sample that you don't necessarily want there. And then at five minutes, the valve switch, we put the trap column in line. The sample gets loaded onto um, our analytical column and the gradient starts. And so after about 15 to 20 minutes of this gradient, you'll start to see peptides coming off of the column. It stays in that position until 142 minutes and then the valves switch back over. So that 
during the equilibration phase, again, we're kind of just flushing stuff um, out to waste instead of putting it through our column and into the instruments. So this is just kind of a way of um, saving some of the, um, the shelf life of the column and also how often we have to clean the quad. So we said this a couple times. Again, our total runtime is 145 minutes. For it to go from start to finish um, with loading the sample and everything, it takes about 160 minutes. So this tends to be a little bit longer. And this here, you can see the only channels I have saved are the loading pump pressure and the NC pump pressure. And what this allows me to do is after I've looked through my data is I can go through and see whether there were changes in pressure. So if you have a big drop or big spike in pressure, that can indicate that there was a clog. Um, and this can just tell you that everything's operating or that if you have a leak that everything's operating correctly. So these are really good checks to like as quality control for your data. There's really nothing in system start, um, start shutdown and startup um, or the script editor that are important for this method. So what we're going to do is go over to our um, MS. And so for um, the Q Exactive, we're running a full MS scan and then we're also doing um, the tandem MS to actually do the fragmentation. So um, again, to set this up, what we did was kind of like dragged over our little method. So we know that this is what the protocol we wanted to run. And specifically what we're looking at is the top 10. And what this means is that it's going to take the top 10 um, most abundant fragments that are being injected into the instrument at any time, and it's gonna send them into um, the MS2 for analysis. You can also have um, like period set aside. So this helps to kind of like in period set aside so that you um, are spacing out how much you're sampling. So once you sample the top 10, then it doesn't look for them anymore and it'll grab the next 10 most abundant peptides, okay? So it's just kind of a way of like um, improving your um, ability to pull out some of the lower um, abundant peaks and decrease that signal, signal to noise ratio. So for our tune file, we use a tune file that's known as the nano lower tune. Um, and this just has parameters set so that we're, we're um, lowering our spray voltage. And I can actually show you maybe if this will, it should work. Um, what this looks like if we load that actual tune file. And so some of the parameters of this, this will all change. So you have your like maximum injection time, which is 250 microseconds, your um, target for your automatic gain control, your positive mode and your resolution. What is going to be important here are our spray voltages and our capillary temperature. So we have our spray voltage set at 3.8, um, which actually seems kind of high. Um, and then our capillary temp at 320. And then everything else is controlled in these general properties that are over here. So if I go back over, let's go into our advanced user role and um, talk about some of the specific settings that we have here. So again, we have our MS um, method duration matching with our LC so that it's collecting and scanning data the entire time. Um, that we have samples coming in. So the best lock masses and um, chromatographic, pe chromatographic peak width um, of 15 seconds are just kind of defaults. Um, and then we use the dynamic exclusion, which remember um, you'll have some explanation here of what this means, um, but it's basically just a max tolerance for your M over Z so that when you're sampling your Kind of spacing things out. Um, and we have our tune file set up here. If we click on the top 10, what happens is now we have our, which are going to be important if you are um, trying to write up what we did for a publication, um, you have the general properties of the full MS. So our general properties, we have positive polarity, um, and we have our runtime. The default charge state is going to be two because we're doing a trypsin digestion. These are proteins, so we would expect them to at least have um, a charge of two. For our full MS, our resolution is going to be 70,000. Our AGC, or automatic gain control target, the number of ions that we want um, 
injected in before we actually like look at them is three e to the six. Um, our maximum injection time, so this is per scanning event, is 100 milliseconds. Our scan range we have set so that it's only including peptide. And so one of the things that I was told when we were setting the instrument up is the best way to optimize this is to only do um, a four time range from whatever your lowest M over Z is to your highest. So oftentimes this will be from like 400 to 1600 M over Z. In this case, we're using 375 to 1575 M over Z. In terms of the tandem mass spec, um, we're going to use a little bit lower resolution, so we only use 17,500. Um, Our target is lower because we expect you're going to have less ions of a particular fragment that are going to be injected into um, orbitrap and analyzed. Our maximum injection time is going to be lower, so this allows us to kind of isolate the things that we're looking at. And then our loop count is 10, so this has to do with that top 10 sampling. So again, it goes for the top 10. Um, bunches of ions that are coming in at a time, analyzes those, and then kind of gets rid of them and looks for the next set. Um, our isolation window is just um, 2 M over Z, which is pretty standard for the instrument. And then our normalized collision energy, which is basically like how much um, gas that we're using to fragment these pieces, is 27. And we went through um, when the technician was here and tested every single normalized collision, collisional energy and looked at the fragmentation patterns to see which one was best for this instrument. And it tended to be 27. Um, so that's what we have been running. And then for um, the data dependent settings, the minimum ACG target, this is pretty standard. So the only other things that we change here is we do charge exclusions. And so because we're, we're specifically interested in looking at peptides, we don't care about anything that has a charge of one a charge of seven, eight, or greater than eight because those aren't gonna be peptides that have been digested with trypsin unless you did a really, really, really bad digesting your sample. Um, and then this dynamic exclusion um, is gonna be 20 seconds, okay? So those are the parameters that um, we change when running the mass spec. And so again, if you're ever trying to write this up for a publication, a good, um, thing to do to figure out like what needs to be included is look at what's been in other papers and you can go through and look at these different settings um, and then plug in what we actually did to kind of like match up that general format of what is required. Um, so hopefully that was helpful.